All right, everybody, and welcome to our first official lecture. What is anthropology anyway, and also what is ethno ethnography, those things that anthropologists produce? So in this lecture, I'm simply going to tell you what anthropology is, uh, go over the four subfields of anthropology, and talk specifically about what an ethnography is, uh, which is the documents, studies, and act of studying that anthropologists produce and do. So anthropology is a really, really broad field of study. Literally, anthropology simply means peopleology or the study of people. Anthro meaning people, ology meaning the study of. So because our field is so broad, here in the United States, we tend to divide uh, anthropology into four different subfields. And these four subfields definitely occasionally work together. Uh, we are in the same department. We take classes together. Um, but in fact, our research can be very, very different. So the four subfields of anthropology are cultural anthropology, the subject of this class, evolutionary, biological, sometimes still called physical anthropology, linguistic anthropology, and archaeology. What we have in common is that all of us study culture. So cultural anthropology is the study of the culture of modern people. It can include modern, still living today, gatherer hunters or hunter gatherers, often sometimes called foragers, and it often does. And that's what most people kind of think of anthropologists is going out and doing is that the, we're the people that go find uh, those, I'm using air quotes, primitive people. I'm not a big fan of that word. Uh, those primitive people living out in the woods and we go hang out with them and we see how they do things. And some of us do do that. Um, but in reality, since we're peopleologists and we study the people, the culture of people, uh, we can study any group of people. You know, if if you find a group of two or more people that have something in common, you can claim that they are, in fact, a culture. So while we might study uh, modern foragers or gatherer hunters living out in the woods, we could also study breast cancer survivors uh, we can study drug users in New York City, and we can study people who play massive multiplayer games online. So breast cancer survivors have a lot in common. They've gone through this uh, shared horrible experience. Uh, they may know terminology that uh, only they know. They have uh, instances and moments that they know more about than anybody else. So they certainly qualify as a culture. So we can look at how that affected them having that uh, disease. and. Uh, how they got through to survive it, right? And and that makes them a culture or a group of people and that they share this commonality having had this disease and they know about experiences and terms and things like that that only they know about. Um, studying drug users in New York City uh, could be in an effort to help them uh, and it could be just to understand the culture of it itself. So, you know, of course, they share things in common. They have terminologies. They have... Uh, get-togethers and things like that. And so it may not seem like something that anthropologists would be interested in, but it is because we want to learn how to better help those people uh, through their issues. Massive multiplayer games have been a really uh, good area of study for cultural anthropologists, and that might surprise you. But effectively, there used to be the idea that uh, people were basically, the cultures that emerged were basically just a product of their physical environment. And so what massive multiplayer games allow us to do, or at least in one or two particular studies, is they looked at how different cultural and social norms emerged across several servers. Uh, these servers have identical versions of the game, and what they looked at was how loot or prizes or treasure was divvied up in each server. And despite the fact that these cultures, these groups of people playing this game, uh, were taking place in identical environments, right? Server one is identical to server two. They found that different ways of sorting and distributing treasures emerged in each server, which suggests that you can have uh, different social norms, different cultural attributes, even when you have identical environments. Um, and that is just a really interesting study uh, because it kind of gives us a identical environment laboratory, something we really don't have very often as cultural anthropologists. So 
these three examples aren't the only things that a cultural anthropologist study by any stretch of the imagination, but they just serve as a variety of examples, very different examples uh, of how cultural anthropologists might study cultures or groups of people that you wouldn't expect them to. So evolutionary, biological, often still sometimes called physical anthropology, it's kind of a tricky subfield to define, but it includes those anthropologists who study the biology of humans or do culture anthropology with an evolutionary theoretical perspective. Um, they study a lot of different things. Uh, they study human health worldwide. One of my professors in my undergraduate studies uh, could look at a person and tell them you or estimate their BMI. Uh, she looked at the effects of uh, culture on people's diet and therefore on their health, right? So she went around uh, measuring the health, the BMI, heart rate of various peoples and looked at how cultural things like what they ate, what they did for a living, uh, affected how healthy they were. Uh, one of my friends in grad school looked at mother-child interactions um, and from an evolutionary perspective. So how does culture affect how child development occurs and how do... Uh, cultures vary in their uh, treatment of children and how that affects their physical health. Uh, she had a story, and I'm paraphrasing the story, about how one time she was watching a child use a machete um, next to their mother. This She was studying a forager group, and she was horrified, right? She finally interrupted the mother she was interviewing and said, how can you let this child use this machete? And the mother just said, they need to learn how to use it, and I'm right here. You know, this two- to three-year-old child could be safe using this machete in the view of the parent uh, because they were right next to the parent, so what could happen? Later, when interviewing and talking to the same person, uh, she was telling them about our daycare, and the woman was just horrified. What, how is this safe? And she said, well, you know, we give them to these people, and they take care of them. She, the mother was horrified that we give our children to strangers for eight, nine, even sometimes ten hours a day. So it shows different parenting practices um, and how a forager might be horrified to be away from their child for ten hours, but is perfectly happy uh, to allow their child to use a machete as long as they're right next to them. Um, often physical, biological, evolutionary anthropologists study modern apes. And that may surprise you because I just told you that anthropology was the study of humans, humanology, effectively. Um, and the reason we look at uh, non-human primates is one of the major quests of anthropologists is to try to figure out <laughs> what is it that makes us different. And it might be that, it, honestly, there isn't that one thing that makes human difference from chimps, right? Supposedly, in terms of DNA, we're 98% chimp and they're 98% us. So the question remains that why is there 7 billion plus of us running around and why do we have Starbucks and planes and cars and houses and chimps that are so very similar to us are endangered and don't, right? So what is that thing? Is it genetic? Is it cultural? Is it both? And so in an effort to figure that out, we study other primates. And it seems like every time we think we have it narrowed down, some cheeky primate um, does that thing that we thought was inherently human. Uh, there's a story about, uh, I believe it was a gorilla in the zoo that uh, hated children and would wait for children to show up and had taken one medium-sized rock in its pen and gone over to a larger-sized rock in its pen and would make stone tools, um, not just smaller rocks to throw, but aerodynamic, sharp rocks, right? And this is very human. Uh, it saw a big rock, and it saw a medium rock, and it saw a method to solve a problem which was annoying children, and it took the medium rock and smacked the large rock and made sharp aerodynamic rocks. Um, so it's not tool use that separates, uh, separates us. Um, we thought it was capability for language, perhaps, but Coco the gorilla was taught sign language. So is it just the physical fact that we can make a variety of noises and the gorillas can't that separates us? Um, and the thing that always bothers me about Coco the gorilla is that she had a concept of self. They asked her what she was, and she described herself as a very fine gorilla person. And she did this in America Sign Language. It's that gorilla person part that always bothered me. She recognized that we were humans and she was a gorilla, but she added that she had sentience, that she was a gorilla person. So it's not a concept of sentience, it seems. It's not tool use, and it's not capacity for language, at least not 
the, the ability to form words and meaning because Coco the gorilla could speak sign language. So what is it that separates us from the other primates? And why do we have Starbucks and planes and coffee and things like that? And the other primates don't. Uh, a emerging and very important form of physical evolutionary uh, biology is the study of modern human genetics. We kind of split that with biology, but we can study human genetics to learn about our ancient past. We can study human genetics to learn about how they're affected by culture and how they affect culture and things like that. Um, and so that's a field that will continue to expand in both anthropology and uh, biology in general. So linguistics is the third subfield of anthropology. It's the study of human language. And of course, human language is linked to culture. It's the way in many times that we express culture. And I am teaching you about anthropology right now using both written language on the PowerPoint and spoken language that you are listening to. Uh, language is affected by culture and culture affects language. Uh, we'll talk about that, about that more during the semester even though it's technically a subfield and not included in culture anthropology i find it really hard to teach culture anthropology without talking about the cultural significance of language um, so these anthropologists study how languages have changed in both modern cultures and how they have emerged and changed throughout human history Archaeology is the final subfield of anthropology, and essentially it's uh, doing cultural anthropology, but on past people, only using their material remains. It's a fancy way of saying we look at trash and try to figure out what people were doing in the past. Despite the fact that I'm currently teaching you cultural anthropology, I am actually an archaeologist. Uh, archaeologists go out and dig up material remains. We only study uh, humans and occasionally pre-humans. We do not study dinosaurs. Those are paleontologists, very different. Um, and archaeologists usually study ancient stone tools, ancient pottery, pollen grains from plants uh, ancient people used, bones of animals left behind by people, so not bones of dinosaurs. Technically, all the bones of dinosaurs we find are fossils anyway. Um, and believe it or not, modern garbage, which may seem confusing, but there was a project in which archaeologists studied modern garbage. And the reason we did that was to see what kind of view, what kind of glimpse we got at our own culture uh, from looking at modern garbage and kind of thinking about the things we were missing, the things we weren't learning about. So it was kind of a test of our methods to see what we can learn about ourselves from looking at modern garbage in an effort to understand what things we can't and can learn um, from looking at people's garbage from the past. So anthropologists do collaborate, uh, despite the fact that we do such widely variable things. Uh, examples include ethno-archaeology, which is a collaboration between cultural and archaeology. It's studying pre present cultures to gain insight about past cultures. An example would be if we found a group of gatherer-hunter people and we went out and studied how they made to stone tools in an effort to assume and figure out how people made stone tools in the past. Uh, evolutionary and biological anthropologists work with archaeologists to do genetic work to determine when pe people entered the new world. Uh, and linguistic anthropologists might work with archaeologists to determine uh, divergence times of language to determine when people entered the new world or went somewhere else. Uh, linguistic anthropologists work with cultural anthropologists to understand how people use different dialects and languages in their work or when the cultural anthropologist seeks to learn a language perhaps uh, to do their field study. Uh, evolutionary and biological anthropologists work with cultural anthropologists, for instance, those studies of human health worldwide and the mother-child interactions that I described are a combination of cultural and evolutionary uh, anthropology. So essentially, we all study culture and we certainly find ways to collaborate, but um, I think maybe more than other fields, we are very diverse and distinct in the things we study um, because anthropology is simply so broad. So I've argued throughout this lecture that the thing that all anthropologists have in common and uh, the thing that cultural anthropologists actually study is culture. So you would think uh, that we would have some really good definitions of culture, but we really don't. Um, I have a definition of culture that I like, but a lot of anthropologists, sociologists, even and other famous folks had offer, have offered forth various definitions of culture. So I'm not going to force you to learn one. 
Uh, but instead, I'll offer you quite a few definitions throughout the semester and kind of let you pick your favorite or cobble together a definition of culture from a couple different ones that I've mentioned. So one of the earliest and most often quoted is that of Edward Tyler, who in 1871 called culture, knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man. He means humans. It was 19 or 1871. So acquired by humans as a member of society. Uh, he left some things out, language, music, signs, and religion that are certainly important. But effectively, Tyler sat down to write this definition, and he thought, well, what kind of things do people do? And so he listed them, knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, custom, and any other. And then he has a second part of the definition, which is, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by people as a member of society. So it's basically he's lists out things that humans do, but he specifies that for it to be culture, you have to have acquired this uh, habit by hanging out with other people, by learning it from other people. So it's all the things that people do that we learn from other people, essentially, is what Tyler is arguing. So to better understand what anthropology is, I did a Google image search. I used to be in the habit of doing this, but basically if you want to know what people think a thing is, doing a Google search or looking at Wikipedia is often a pretty good way of figuring that out. It might not necessarily be what that thing actually is, but it is a good method to figure out what people think it is. All right, so the first image that comes up or did come up when I did the search was this kind of swirly thing. It was probably on the cover of a textbook. And what you see here is a variety of different people, and you probably have already inferred that they are from different places or from different cultures. And you probably did that by looking at their manner of dress, the color of their skin, where you think they're from, so on and so forth. And so this works pretty well as an image for anthropology because we study different people from different places that and that's certainly true but then it has this kind of overall healthy message of we're all swirling together to be one human population and that's good um so it doesn't surprise me that this comes up and it, it certainly is true that that anthropologists study a variety of people doing a variety of things in a variety of different places This one is definitely a textbook cover. <laughs> what we see here is a at the top you see anthropology written, uh, or in the middle, and at the top you see a group of people living uh, deep in the jungle. Uh, some people might describe them, air quotes again, as being primitive. I don't like that word. I find that everybody is modern and everybody has functional solutions to our day-to-day -day problems. Um, so it's the kind of people you would think anthropologists would study. At the bottom left, I know exactly what that is. That is a group of people excavating in a rock shelter. Uh, rock shelters provided homes for people throughout history, especially those who were too mobile to build homes or didn't feel like building houses. Um, so a lot of times archaeologists find themselves excavating in rock shelters. Uh, they're somewhat challenging to excavate in because soil uh, buildup is very quick, uh, meaning that there are very fine layers. Well, actually, it's very slow, meaning that there are very fine layers to excavate. You can uh, dig not very deeply and go through hundreds of years. So you have to be kind of careful to make sure you're moving through the soil layers in a careful and uh, good way to preserve all the context of all the artifacts. In the bottom right is somebody practicing slash and burn agriculture or uh, horticulture, depending on how much they're producing. Essentially what that is, is when you have, for example, four fields, uh, you slash and burn one field, and then you bring the nutrients back to the soil. Then you switch fields, letting that one lay fallow. You slash and burn the area, uh, bringing nutrients back to the soil. You farm there for a while. You move to field three. You slash and burn, uh, letting the plants die, bringing nutrients back to the soil, and farm there for a while and move to the fourth field, and so on and so forth. Each time killing the plants, burning it to pr uh, provide nutrients to the soil before moving on to the next parcel of land. So of the images that I found in my Google search, this is by far the most important, um, or at least the one I use to illustrate the most, one of the most important concepts in cultural anthropology, though it is an old one. Um, so this image, I can tell from the URL to the left of it, was taken from the University of Tennessee Knoxville anthropology website. I don't know what it is. Um, I've never looked it up. I've never looked into it. It's just the thing that came up during the image search. And so we can see some interesting shapes. It's certainly artistic, right? There might be one person. There might be two people. We're not quite sure. This is definitely a person's head here. 
This may be another person's head here or a mask. This could be another person, and this is probably another person holding something on their head. Um, but ultimately, we really don't know what's going on here. Or maybe you do, but I don't think so. Uh, we have this kind of maybe a chicken down here, some kind of bird, and some kind of cattle, but it's kind of got a zebra pattern down here. And the point is that somebody out there, somewhere, knows exactly what this is, the artist, and probably people within the same culture as the artist. And this illustrates a concept that a anthropologist named Franz Boas came up with. This is something I would write down that isn't on the slide. And he called this Kultur Brilla, which is literally German for culture glasses. And what he means by this is not only is your culture the things you know and the things you learn from other people, but it's also a pair of glasses that tint and change the way you view the world. So we are better able to interpret symbols uh, and concepts if we know about what that means in our own cultural context. So what I mean is that somebody somewhere has the right culture brilla to interpret this. It's just not us. So culture is not only the things you know, but it also shapes and changes the way you view the world, just like glasses. And it's a very important concept uh, to realize as we look through culture anthropology, that it's not just the things we know, the things we've learned, the language we speak, but also culture can shape how you view the world. <clears throat> this image is a little silly, but it's got different other non-human primates and then man slash humans on the right. It illustrates that anthropologists, physical evolutionary anthropologists do compare primates to uh, humans, we are a primate as well, and try to figure out key differences and things like that. This one just simply shows the four branches of anthropology, subfields, linguistic anthropology, archaeology, cultural anthropology, and biological anthropology, and shows that we're all one study. So that one's not really that surprising. I really wish this wasn't one of the things you see when you see anthropology. And this is the first and last time that you will see human remains in any of my slides. It is often considered bad taste in anthropological uh, demonstrations and presentations to show, especially those of indigenous people, uh, human remains. So I'm only using this for illustrative purposes. People think of us as being people who look at skulls and at worst people who rob graves. And in the past, they were kind of right, especially archeologists. Um, there's this idea that forensic anthropology is very popular after shows like CSI, and so people want to go into forensic anthropology and learn about how to measure skulls and things like that. Um, that being said, this person was obviously killed by blunt force trauma, um, and it is something anthropologists occasionally do. Um, but human remains and the study of human remains is clearly a very touchy subject and not something that I do lightly. Uh, when I do study human remains in those rare occasions, I try to have the permission of the indigenous people if I'm studying human remains of indigenous people. And usually I'm doing it because I accidentally found human remains. Uh, very few anthropologists, very few archaeologists at this point um, want to find human remains. And there are some specialists who specialize in human remains, but we try to study, excavate, and uh, relocate human remains in as respectful a manner as possible. Um, even though in the past our field has not been great at doing that. This image is kind of silly and incorrect. It shows a chimp on the left. We did not evolve from chimps. Chimps and ourselves share a common ancestor, meaning about 9 million years ago, chimps and us were the same thing. Chimps went to the left, evolutionarily speaking, and we went to the right. But it's kind of a goofy cartoon that shows a uh, chimp leading to pre-humans and then us being slumped back over over computers it's silly and incorrect and that's often sometimes things you get when you associate with anthropology so lesson to be learned here we did not evolve from chimps we share a common ancestor we are both modern primates therefore we couldn't evolve one from the other um, but we do have pre-humans uh, in our evolutionarily evolutionary past 
So we've spent a lot of time talking about what anthropology is. Here are a few examples of what anthropology is not. Anthropology, sadly, is not Indiana Jones, even though he's an archaeologist. Uh, I would consider Indiana Jones to be more of an antiquarian. He tends to steal things and run. Archaeologists spend a lot of time figuring and taking notes about the exact context of the artifacts we find, where we find them, and what they mean. So if you go, think about that scene in Indiana Jones where he's uh, measuring the sand in the bag and about to put it down, a real archaeologist would have gotten squished by the boulder because we would have been taking notes about how much the idol weighed, where exactly we found it, drew, drawing a map. Uh, archaeologists take extensive notes before removing artifacts. So uh, Indiana Jones is an archaeologist. There are a couple movie, uh, moments in the movies where I'm like, okay, that was an anthropologist kind of thing to do. But really, he kind of steals things and runs, and that's not really what we're about. Anthropology is not a store in the mall, even though it is a store in the mall uh, that sells places, things from other places and cheap. And I don't know what it sells. Uh, I don't go in there. It smells funny. Uh, but if you Google anthropology, often it will correct you to anthropology spelled in German, which is this uh, franchise of stores found in malls. And anthropologists do not study dinosaurs. Uh, archaeologists don't do that because uh, dinosaurs and humans never existed. And we are peopleologists. So cultural anthropologists produce these studies known as ethnography or ethnographies, plural. It's slightly confusing because we will also say that we're doing ethnography. So we use it as a verb. It's the study we're doing. We are conducting an ethnography and we produce a document called an ethnography. Uh, the key to most ethnographies is fieldwork. We study people doing things in certain places, as your textbook says. Anthropologists gather data in the field and we write descriptions of the culture or subculture that we are studying and then we write uh, long papers or books about that culture. We do what's known as emic. Uh, we provide most often the insider's perspective, though we also occasionally use the edict or outsider's perspective. We'll talk more about that in the future. Uh, but as your textbook states, anthropologists study something and we do it somewhere. Right. So we tend to go hang out with the people we study. We'll talk about a few rare exceptions to that, but they are few and far between. So ethnography, the basis of ethnography is the idea is that to understand what people do, uh, that you their culture, you should probably at least watch them doing it. Right. So we go and we hang out with these people uh, and we write down interesting notes about what they're doing. Uh, and sometimes we even participate in the activities ourselves. That's certainly not outside the limits of ethnography. So there are some strengths to the ethnography. Often we get the insider's perspective. We try to learn about what it is to be in that culture from people. Um, we realize that sometimes people lie on surveys and we watch them. Basically, we hang out with them. We do what's called participant observation until we catch them doing something that they say they wouldn't do. Um, so most people of the United States would say that they are patriotic if asked, but don't know the words of the national anthem. So we kind of look for things that cultures say they do, but actually in practice uh, don't end up doing. That's not all we look for, but we certainly pay attention uh, when that occurs. There are also some weaknesses of ethnography. We try to get the insider's perspective. Uh, so sometimes we tend to consider the culture in isolation. We forget that people change and want to keep the cultures we study under glass. We uh, kind of have, in my opinion, bad models for how cultures influence each other. Um, and so we try to study them in isolation, but in this increasingly uh, globalizing world, um, it's difficult to do that. Often anthropologists will become attached to the cultures people and people they study and ignore their faults. Um, and this is really illustrated well on this far side comic over to the right, uh, where you have these native people seeing anthropologists coming and they're hiding their VCRs and TVs and lamps and things like that because anthropologists expect them to be a certain way. And we don't often um, know how to deal when we see influence from the outside world or change, technologically speaking, uh, in the cultures we study. So that's all I have for today. So a lot of things to think about. Be sure to read uh, the relevant sections of your textbook and email me any questions you may have.